Well, good morning. Uh, it's good to see you guys. And uh, before we get into the, the sermon today, I just want to make a quick uh, clarification on an announcement that's in your bulletin. Uh, our congregation, our annual congregational meeting will be on November the 19th at the end of each service that morning. And it says in your bulletin that we are going to be voting on some uh, bylaw amendments, but that is not going to take place. Uh, there's still some more work to be done on that, and we're not uh, prepared for that at this time. So uh, just strike that part, but there will be a congregational meeting on November the 19th, and we hope that you'll make plans to be here as we'll be voting on the budget, elders and deacons and that sort of thing uh, as well. You know, from time to time, I feel it's important to revisit today's topic. Um, today's message is sort of what I call a maintenance topic. It's something we need to talk about periodically. Um, I, it's kind of like preventative medicine. You know, there's certain medicines you take after you've gotten sick, but then there are some vitamins and supplements and things you take to try to prevent uh, from getting sick. And so uh, today is one of those messages I want us to keep in the forefront of our minds um, to make sure that we are uh, aware of certain things and intentional about certain things. You know, God has blessed this church, and, and I believe he's been working powerfully through this church over the years, uh, but particularly here in the last several months, it just seems like God has been at work. The Holy Spirit has moved among us and done great things, and he's drawn a good number of souls to hear God's truth proclaimed. A good number of those souls have been saved, and we are on pace, I believe, uh, to have the greatest number of baptisms we've ever had in a year before. He's drawn a good number of souls to repent and to rededicate their lives to obeying Christ and walking in harmony with the will of God. And you know, spiritual growth in someone's life, it's a little less tangible. It's hard to put a number on and to quantify it. But I just, through observation, have seen people who have kind of stepped out of apathy and seem to have a renewed zeal for the things of God. They're starting to get more plugged in to the work of God, and that's encouraging to see as well. And so today I say all of this to the glory of God. Can we give God praise for what his spirit is doing in our church family? But I say all of that to say this. We have a very real adversary who notices that too, and he hates it. He would love to tear it down, and he's always looking for a way to get a foothold in the door and to devour all the good things that are happening. Where he sees spiritual growth, he wants to entice people back into sensuality, back into temptation, back into sin. Where he sees kingdom work, he wants to lull people back into apathy and indifference. Where he sees love and harmony, he wants to introduce division. He's always looking to tear down what God is building and doing for his kingdom. If you have your Bible with you, I invite you to turn with me to our main text for today, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'm going to start with verse 10. And it says this, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there may be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind in the same judgment. You know, for Satan to get his claws into a church, I think the first thing he has to do is to get us distracted, to get our eyes off the prize and the main focus and to get us distracted and focused on other things. I just want to be clear that our main purpose as a church is to fulfill the Great Commission. We want to stay focused on, on doing what we can to reach lost souls and to bring them to a saving relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. That, that is paramount in our focus and attention. Then once they come to Christ, we want to do everything we can to disciple them and to help them not just stay a baby Christian, but to grow in their faith and mature in Christ and, and reach a mature understanding and obedience to God. We must never lose our focus as a church on evangelism and discipleship. They must always remain at the forefront. You know, you can, can tell when a church begins to lose its focus on the main thing. One of the things that happens is side issues and disputable matters start to become the main topics of discussion and focus. 
You know, do you realize how many churches, and maybe you've been a part of this in the past, how many churches have split over carpet colors? Uh, who gets to sing special music, whether the preacher wears a tie or not, or, or whatever the, 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 the topic might be in your situation, churches have really experienced heartbreaking division over lesser things. Or it might be over doctrinal matters. Some are important, but some aren't really that important, but we divide. Sometimes the division occurs because people within the church may be competing for power and control, and it becomes a, a pride and an ego thing between people in the church. Now, I read about a small church in Kentucky back in the 1890s, and I, I can't verify the truth of this story, so just take it for what it is, but I did read it from several different sources that gives me a little credibility with it. But apparently there was a small church in western Kentucky where two deacons, there were two, I guess they only had two deacons, but they were constantly arguing with one another. And they just didn't get along. And their bickering came to a head one Sunday when one of them noticed a small wooden peg had been driven in the back wall of the church for the preacher to hang his hat on. He became angry, the deacon did, at the other deacon, and he went to him and said, how dare you hang a peg in the church wall without first consulting me? And as word got out about this latest disagreement, people in the church started taking sides. And some thought putting the peg in the wall was fine and helpful to the preacher. Others thought it desecrated the sanctuary and were very upset about it. So eventually the feud split the congregation and a number of people left the church to start their own congregation and it said, I find this hard to believe, but it said that the people in that town still refer to the two churches as Peg Baptist and Anti-Peg Baptist. Now, I don't know if that's true, but it's interesting if it is. I'm not sure who was first credited with writing this poem, but its words are often true. To live above with saints we love will certainly be glory. But to live below with the saints we know, well, that's another story. And maybe you've experienced that in the past. It's my hope that when we find ourselves getting worked up over an issue, that we pause and we get perspective and we ask ourselves, is this a salvation issue? Is this worth fighting over? Is this going to affect whether someone will be in heaven or not? And if so, then let's talk about it. But if not, let's determine to keep it in perspective and not take our eyes off the prize. You know, Paul goes on in this word, he guards against the formation of factions. In verse 11, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Paul expresses concern that he sees fractions developing within, or factions, fractions, factions developing within the church. And some people's primary allegiance, instead of being to Christ ultimately, seems to be to a person within the church or a personality. You know, factions can form along a variety of lines. Sometimes a faction can form around the preacher. And the preachers at odds with the leaders of the church and, and some support the leaders of the church, some, some support the, the preacher. Or it may be a Sunday school teacher or an elder or a deacon that, that has a different idea from the rest. And so it starts to spread out into the congregation and people start taking sides. Often this leads to different agendas, different rivalries and disputes and bitterness and unrest within the congregation. Paul goes on to explain that that the church, he says, it's, it's all about Christ. We can't forget that simple fact. It, we, we must not allow the church to be divided into factions. It, he goes on in verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? This is Christ's church. And his cause is bigger than any individual's opinions or ideas. His truth is what guides and directs and matters. And that certainly includes me or any other individual associated with this church. You know, if you'll allow me to use a sports analogy, I know not everybody likes sports, but bear with me. You can be a great coach. You can have a talented roster of five-star All-American players. But if you can't get those players 
to set aside their personal egos, their personal goals and ambitions for the good of the team, I bet you that sports team is going to underachieve. They're not going to reach their fullest potential if they're worried about their individual stats more than they are the success of the team. And that's true in a family, it's true in a business, and it's certainly true in a church. You've got to buy into a team concept. No one person, no one group is bigger than the mission of the organization. In another passage in Corinthians, Paul says this, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You're God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The main thing, the main one, the the source of all truth and direction. You know, we all have a role to play in the work of the kingdom that's being done here at at the Carpenters Christian Church. And it's important that we play our role faithfully and not worry about who gets the credit and not worry about uh, who's recognized, but make sure that God receives all the glory. It takes all of us pulling in the same direction, working in unison to be maximally fruitful and productive for the kingdom of God. That's our goal. That's our desire. You know, I encourage us today not to, de- to determine that we're not going to divide over secondary issues. We don't have to agree on every point of doctrine to be brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? I- I've heard the phrase before, we don't have to be twins to be brothers and sisters. We don't have to be exactly alike in every regard to be brothers and sisters in Christ. There are salvation issues that we do have to be uh, in agreement upon. That if anybody ever thinks that there's another way to God than through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, then that's that a problem because that is a salvation issue. There is no way to the Father except through the Son. And so we have to be lockstep on that. But there are also other issues of secondary importance that it's okay to agree to disagree over, and I think we'll both be in heaven. We don't agree 100% on every point of doctrine, even as a staff, even as elders. There are things that, that we look at and interpret slightly differently on some matters, but we're agreeable about it because they're not salvation issues. On the salvation issues, we are in 100% agreement. And there's harmony among our staff and among our our elders in those regards. The Apostle Paul advised the church at Rome not to divide over secondary issues that don't affect salvation. Romans 14.1 says, Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. You see, we we can disagree within the church without being disagreeable toward one another. I read about George Whitefield the great preacher of many years ago who was a great example of this, uh, although Whitefield disagreed with John Wesley on some theological matters, he was careful not to create problems publicly that could be used to hinder the ministry of either of them. When someone asked Whitefield if he thought he would see Wesley in heaven one day, Whitefield said, I fear not, because he, he may be so near the eternal throne and I at such a distance that I may not be able to get sight of him. I thought that was a very kind and respectful way of answering that question. You know, it's important to keep the unity of the body of Christ as a top priority. Romans 14, 19 says, so let us then pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Sometimes keeping a brother or sister in Christ is more important than winning an argument or being vindicated over a wrong. You know, a big way that factions form is through gossip. And we've got to be careful about guarding against gossip and idle talk. Man, that's true not just in a church. That's true in your family. That's true in your workplace. We can wound one another by talking about one another. And often those those wounds go deep. Some people think that as long as it's true, it's not gossip. (laughs) But gossip can can form these factions and the, the 
the truth is that we're generally gossiping if we're passing on the information and the reason we're passing it on is not because we're trying to help. We just want to pass on the information. It may or may not be true. There are times when certain things need to be reported so that appropriate action could be taken. Nobody's saying, hey, don't, don't say things that, that could help or that could remedy or, or, or prevent harm from happening. There are times when you need to pass something on. But often our motivation is just to pass on some juicy news or to slander somebody we don't particularly like anyway. And that can be so destructive to the, the family of God. Don't take pride in being the one that everyone comes to in order to find out the scoop on what's going on. And you know who they are. You know right now in your workplace who that person is. If I want to know what's going on, I'm going to go see so-and-so. And it might, if you don't know who it is, it might be you. You never know. But if someone can tell you everything that's going on in the lives of other people, guess what? They're probably telling other people what's going on in your life as well. So be careful who you confide in, who you trust, and how you relate to those folks. You know, a good little acronym that I came across several years ago that I really like and I, I still think about uh, pretty often, I want to share with you today. It's to, before you speak, to think, T-H-I-N-K. The T stands for, is it true? Okay, certainly if it's not true, you don't want to pass it on. But consider, is this true? And am I confident that it is? The H stands for, is it helpful? Am I telling this because I'm wanting to help the situation or am I just telling this just because I want to pass on some juicy uh, gossip? The I stands for, is it inspiring? Is this going to lift people up or is this going to tear people down? What is my goal in passing this on? The N is, is it necessary? Is it important that I pass this on or would it just as well be left unsaid? Sometimes the best thing you can say is nothing. Is it necessary that I pass this on? And then the K is, is it kind? And if it doesn't pass these tests, it might be left, best left unsaid. You know, there's another side to gossip, though. You might be the one telling the gossip, or you might be the one receiving the gossip. And I encourage you today, church, refuse to listen to gossip. If you know it's gossip and you agree to listen into it, you're involved. And the next time somebody comes to you with gossip, I tell you something powerful to do is just want, as soon as you figure out this is gossip, just say, hey, I don't want to hear this. I, I don't feel comfortable knowing this. I'd just rather talk about something else. Nothing shuts gossip down quicker than not having an audience for it. You know, when you refuse to listen to gossip, it makes me think of Proverbs 26, for lack of wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no whisperer, quarreling ceases. When, when you don't throw more wood on the fire by participating in it, it quickly dies out. Don't allow a, a gossiper to remain anonymous. Now, you all know how this works. One of a gossiper's favorite lines is, don't tell anybody I told you this. But that's usually a pretty sure sign that what's coming next is going to be gossip. They may come to you and say, people are saying, somebody told me. Well, I've learned over the years to ask, well, who are these people? And if they're reluctant to tell you, that you, that's usually not a conversation needs to go much further. It's if it's important enough to complain about, it's important enough to put your name on it and stand behind it. Another way to put an end to gossip is to name the people who are doing the gossiping. And when they lose their anonymity, most gossip stops. The most destructive thing that you can do, though, if you want to create factions, if you want to divide a church, is to go out and talk to everybody else that's involved that's not involved in it instead of going to the person that is involved in it. I want to encourage you. It's inevitable when we have a, a group of people together that we're going to bump into each other. We're going to disagree over things. But please, church, talk to people and not about people. Talk to one another and not about one another. The right thing to do is to go to the person who offended you or is responsible for the situation. And listen, go with the right spirit. Go in a respectful manner. Sometimes your point can be right, but the way that you went about it was wrong. Nobody likes to be attacked. If you come in at somebody like this, you're probably not going to get anywhere productive because people's defenses automatically go up. Go in a spirit of reconciliation not in frustration or to seek revenge. You know, the Bible gives a prescription for how to handle it when we offend one another or hurt one another. 
within the church. This is not a new problem. This is not a, a year 2000 problem. This is, goes all the way back to the early days of the church when they were squabbling with one another. Paul was dealing with it then. We're still dealing with it today. But Jesus says in Matthew 18, he says to go directly to the person responsible. Verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. When you talk about people instead of talking to them, you risk creating factions and dividing the body of Christ. Step two, take one or two important people with you, or uh, impartial people, important people, <laughs> impartial people with you to help mediate the, the, the conflict. In verse 16, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that at every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. You're not seeking to build a faction and get people that agree with you to gang up on this person, but people that know both of you and can help you hear one another and, and mediate this discussion. And finally, step three, take it to the leaders of the church. It says in verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let it be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. By this point, if it isn't resolved, it's a threat to the harmony of, of the church. And so the Bible's very clear. Go to people and seek to resolve it. Nine times out of 10, if you go directly to a person and you come with the right spirit, most conflicts can be resolved. You know, I encourage you today, church, to make every effort to work through disagreements and hurts. And if you talk to a lot of people today about church, they'll tell you, I used to go to church, but I had a bad experience in church. I got my feelings hurt in church and I never went back. I got my feelings hurt in a restaurant one time, but look at me, I've been going back. Uh, it's inevitable in life that we're gonna bump into each other. But for some reason, when it comes to church, we don't give the church a second chance that we come sometimes and say, but if anybody ever hurts me there, I'm out. I'm gone and I'm never coming back. After all, this is a Christian institution and things like that don't happen in a church. <laughs> Wrong. While we serve a God, listen, who is loving, who is merciful, who is holy, who is perfect in all of his ways, the body of Christ on earth today is comprised of believers who may be repentant but are still not perfected, who may have the Holy Spirit but still struggle against the flesh like we talked about last week and sometimes are still fall back into that sinful nature. We are a body of believers that while we may have many here who are mature in their faith, we also have many who are still immature in their faith. They're babes in Christ. And while we may have many genuine followers of Christ that make up this church family, we also have those who are still unconverted. And so we come to church expecting this to be this utopian place that nobody's ever gonna do any mean thing, but sometimes people are still living in the flesh. And sometimes even well-intentioned people just have weak moments and they inadvertently hurt others. So I encourage you, don't expect your church family to be perfect. How many of you, your extended family is perfect? I don't see any hands today, right? When you have your Thanksgiving get together or your Christmas get together, you always say, oh, cousin so-and-so is gonna be there, get ready, right? We have that in our physical blood families, but because we're family, we, we realize we gotta hold in there with each other and we need the same attitude toward our spiritual family. If your commitment to this church or any other will only last until you're slighted, until you're offended, disappointed, or hurt, you probably won't be here for the long haul or in any church for the long haul. Like any earthly family, this spiritual family of believers has its share of challenging people and imperfect situations, and it requires forgiveness and grace. And, and that's, there will be situations where you're faced with the choice. Am I going to listen to my pride and make a big deal out of this? Or for the sake of the unity of the body of Christ, can I overlook this offense and let it go? Romans 12 says, never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Don't get 
pulled into that worldly pattern of, well, if you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back twice as bad. Uh, Romans 12, 21 says, don't be, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Show those maybe who have hurt you a better way that I'm not going to retaliate. If you're waiting for me to respond in kind, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to give you kindness in exchange for the hurt you gave me. Sometimes families, businesses, teams, and even churches avoid drama simply because someone was big enough to say, I'm going to let that go. You know, for all the church hurt that may be in this room or maybe there's somebody watching online or listening by radio today and you think, I, I'm never going back to church or I'm here but I'm carrying some things with me today that I don't know that I'll ever get over. I apologize to each one of you who's ever been hurt or wounded in a church, especially if it was this one. First of all, I, I'm not naive enough to think that, that there aren't those that I've hurt in this church. And perhaps it was careless words that wounded you. Or perhaps you felt that I slighted you in some way or I overlooked something that I should have noticed. I'm sorry. I ask that you forgive me and, and not form your opinion of a perfect savior based upon an imperfect follower of his. I invite you to come to me. And I may or may not even know about the hurt that I've caused you. But I guarantee you this, I would love to have reconciliation. I would love to have that reconciled. If one of my brothers or sisters in Christ that are part of my church family have wounded you, I apologize. There's not a finer church family that I would ever want to be a part of. And I'm a little bit biased, but these are my people. And I love them. And there's a lot of the, some of the best people I know are a part of this church family. We got a few knotheads too. And sometimes it's me, right? But we are a family. We are a collection of imperfect people. People who sometimes react on emotion rather than wisdom. People who sometimes are too careless with their words. People who can be hypocritical. People who occasionally fall short of the righteousness and the righteous standard that our Savior calls us to live by. But please, don't let an imperfect church keep you from serving a perfect Savior. Don't let an imperfect church or especially one imperfect person keep you from salvation or a sanctifying relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't give anybody that much power over your life. Let me pray for us today. God, I know that in one of Jesus' final prayers, he was praying for the unity of all who would believe in him. He was praying that we could be one as a a family of believers just the way that you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are, are one. God, we're struggling with that. We hurt each other sometimes. Sometimes we don't even mean to. And Lord, we, we carry bitterness sometimes. Lord, would you help us to forgive the way that you forgive? Would you help us, Lord, to, to love the way that you love? And God, most of all, please don't let Satan have a foothold and to get in and to disrupt the good things of the kingdom that you want to do through this church body. Help us to be intentional about staying focused on lost souls. Staying focused on leading people to a full obedience to bring them along, God, in the faith. Father, where we have hurt others, we ask you to forgive us. Where we have misrepresented your character and what you're about, would you please forgive us? And God, would you hold us together? Help us to stay in this, this race of life, shoulder to shoulder, fighting for the kingdom with one another, not against one another, God. Help us to fight side by side against our real adversary who is Satan. And Lord, I pray that you'll bind us together in love. One church family under one Savior, under the banner of the one cross that saves us all. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Maybe you're here today and you've never put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. We're going to give you an opportunity to come and receive him as your Lord and your Savior. If you'd like to talk to somebody, come over there to the decision room to your right. If you want to just come and pray today, this is a time for prayer. Lay it down. Don't carry burdens away from here today. But let's respond to the Spirit of God this morning.